Hey, everybody. Let's see if we can find seats, if there are any. Infill, infill yeah, infill seating. We like that. <laughs> this is really wonderful to see this many people here. I'm really excited for tonight. My name is Karen. I'm a member of the Building a Better Bend board. There are um, a bunch of us here tonight in the middle. I'll ask you to stand up. So what is Building a Better Bend? For those of you who haven't heard of us, we're a nonprofit organization. We've been around for almost 20 years. Uh, seems amazing that it's been that long. Um, our mission is to bring expert speakers to Bend to share experiences and ideas that might be new, that have a positive effect on Bend that we can use, or just things that we're interested and excited about. Um, a bunch of my fellow board members are in the audience. Could I ask you guys to stand up or stick your hand up or something so everybody can see who you are? Yay! <laughs> We've, we've recently got an infusion of wonderful new blood on the board, which makes me very happy. Lots of energy. Um, I'd like um, to take another moment to see if we have any elected or appointed officials in the audience. I know that they are. I know Mike's here. Yay, Mike. Um, we'll introduce him in a second. Mike is a city councilor. Yes. Um, so we have a free annual lecture series um, that we do every year. It wouldn't be possible without our sponsors. Um, we envisioned this three-part, three, that's three, um, three-part lecture series to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Oregon's land use planning system. And we were really fortunate to have First Interstate Bank volunteers step up to be the series title sponsor which is kind of a first for us. Um, their investment in our community is undeniable, and I would like to ask uh, Justin Taylor, who's a vice president at First Interstate, to come up and say a few words. Thank you all so much for attending tonight. I really appreciate the sacrifice um, of your time and the curiosity you have to engage in this forum. I believe we are all here because we have a positive impact on this community, and with the help of building a better bend, we can achieve that impact. I have the distinct pleasure of representing First Interstate Bank as our major sponsor of this three-part lecture series. As many of you know, First Interstate Bank came to Central Oregon through the acquisition of Bank of the Cascades in 2017. BOTC, as they were called, was founded in 1977 right here in Bend and is arguably the foremost institution responsible for financing the real estate development in Deschutes County for at least the last 20 years. Although many of the faces here at First Interstate are new, including my own, our organization is replete with BOTC personnel with decades of experience living and lending in Central Oregon. Our leaders not only share the same enthusiasm for this community as our clients, we also share some of the same scars from down cycles of the past. Just as we have overcome Y2K, we all remember the dot-com bubble, September 11th, and the Great Recession. I believe this COVID hangover will clear and we will all emerge wiser and more resilient. First Interstate remains committed to our longtime relationships and to building new ones with the future business leaders of this community. As a bank, we are proud to provide the financial lubrication to keep the local engine of this economy running. Despite the economic headwinds and challenges of a rising interest rate environment, our doors remain open and we continue to finance selective real estate projects in addition to providing treasury services and lending to businesses and individuals of all shapes and sizes. As a community partner, we work closely with nonprofits, both big and small, topping the league tables for corporate volunteer hours and financial contributions in Central Oregon. I began my personal life journey on a ranch south of Burns, 
but spent most of my childhood in Bend. As my mother worked in the mill and went to COCC to get her degree in nursing, I went to school here. I rode my bike here. I explored the forests and the rivers here. I looked for crawdads down in Drake Park. From the ranch, I got to experience another aspect of life. My spring breaks were spent moving cows, summer breaks, putting up hay, and winter breaks, feeding said cows. Traveled a lot of miles in central Oregon, and I eventually left Bend in the early 90s, and I believe the population back then was around 19,000 and change. Returning 30 years later, the natural beauty of this place remains. I have a great deal of gratitude for those who came before and had the vision to protect the heart of our community, providing a near-perfect place to finish raising my four boys. I look forward to learning from our speakers the historic details which have contributed to making this place the place we love and all call home. Thank you for your patience with me, and thanks again for your participation in this lecture series. We have a lot of sponsors tonight, um, and bear with me while I read them all. Our supporting sponsors include Central Oregon Land Watch, who for 37 years has served as a land use watchdog to ensure that our Oregon land use laws have been upheld correctly. LRS Architects, a majority woman-owned architecture and interior design firm with offices in Portland and Bend, founded in 1976 the award-winning practice is driven by a passion for good design that goes beyond aesthetics to create vibrant communities and spaces that support those who inhabit them. Miller Lumber, everybody who lives in Bend knows Miller Lumber, serving Central Oregon's builders and homeowners since 1911, before even I moved here. <laughs> and r &H Construction, builders of projects that define Northwest identity and push the imagination of what's possible in construction, and Cascadia Partners, a full-service urban planning, real estate, environmental sustainability, and public engagement consulting firm. Additionally, we have a long list of partners for this year's series, including Kittleson & Associates, CEA Consulting Engineers, Ashley & Vance, Crabtree Architecture & Design, HWA, I never know how to do project, whatever, Project Carrot, <laughs> SunWest, Builders, 10 Over Studio, I should have, I should have asked that before this, um, Kelcon, Palmer Homes, KPFF, COIC, Stemic Design and Architecture, and Hand in Hand Productions. Thank you for all your support. So as you know, this is the first of a three-part lecture series examining the history of Oregon's land use laws how we maintain or enhance our livability as our community continues to grow and urbanize, as well as how we can stay resilient in the, in the face of macro factors such as population growth, climate change, natural disasters, public health emergencies, and more. And so tonight we're really excited to have Jeff Mates and Robert Liberty with us to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Oregon's land use planning system and share the history of how Oregon became such a unique state. And I'll just share a little story. I'm a planner, and years ago I got my planning certification, which is a national certification, and I went to a training seminar on how to take the exam, and the instructor kept saying, remember, this is a national exam. Oregon is weird. <laughs> so Jeff Mapes, who many of you know, is a reporter for Oregon Public Broadcasting. He covered state and national politics for the Oregonian for nearly 30 years, 32 years. Um, he recently did a six-part podcast called Growing Oregon that if you haven't seen, you must. Um, it was really, really good. A lot of names that I hadn't heard or thought of for the longest time. It was really fun. Um, and it explores how Oregon ended up with the strictest land use policies in the country and how those laws have influenced almost every aspect of our daily lives. <clears throat> he lives in Portland, Oregon, where he's a longtime bicycle commuter. Robert Liberty has more than four decades of experience 
It's always nice to meet someone who has, who's been around longer than me. I love it. I'm just saying I'm old. You're old. Yeah. yeah. That's a, seasoned, right? Um, has more than four decades of experience with the implementation, improvement, enforcement, and politics of Oregon land use planning program and other states and countries. He served as the senior staff attorney and executive director of 1000 Friends of Oregon. He's been a county land use hearings officer. That's the most fun job. Senior counsel to Congressman Errol Blumenauer and director of urban sustainability programs at the University of Oregon and Portland State University. He was elected to the Metro Council in 2004 and re-elected in 2008. He's a current member and past chair of the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area Commission and is a planning consultant affiliated with Cascadia Partners, LLC. Robert has degrees from the University of Oregon, Oxford University, and Harvard Law School. He was born and raised in Oregon and is a heck of a good storyteller. So I am looking forward to this. Here we go. Hello, thanks so much for the uh, very kind introduction. It is really wonderful to be back out here in Bend and uh, thinking about this talk I'm about to give about uh, land use. And it made me think of really the uh, first time I came out to Central Oregon. I was a, a young re political reporter who just landed here in 1984, uh, had been working back east for several years after growing up in California. And my wife and I uh, came driving over the Cascades to go to a political event at the end of the Seventh Mountain. And we were just blown away driving through the Central Oregon, the, the beautiful scenery. We couldn't believe this was still part of Oregon. It was nothing like anything we had seen before. And it just, once again, I, I think back to that sense of wonder that I had and how much uh, pride Oregonians have in their state and how important the, the landscape here is. Of course, I also remember the last 20 uh, miles or so of the ride was sheer hell because our uh, one-year-old daughter in the back had a diaper blowout, and it was... <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> uh, let me set the stage uh, by, by saying that I did spend over a year trying to figure out the history of this system. I mean, I'm, I've been a political reporter uh, in Oregon for over 40 years, so I certainly had a lot of experience with the system. Uh, you can't cover politics in Oregon without getting into it for, for some degree. But uh, it, it did take some time to go back in there and, and really see it, I, I hope, and maybe and give me a new perspective on it. And um, one thing that was very striking to me is that uh, it often gets shorthanded in journalistic discussions, you know, Oregon's land use system. It's, it's almost uh, gets, gets mentioned with fewer words than, than many other, say, accomplishments of Tom McCall. And in fact, there's, there's really a lot very compelling and a lot of uh, human drama in this whole story, really. And so I wanted to start out uh, by playing a short promotional clip that, um, that we did for the podcast series that maybe give you a little sense of where I'm going with this. And hey, it's also kind of an ad too, so maybe, maybe some of you will listen in. I'm Jeff Mapes, and for 38 years, I've covered politics and government in the Pacific Northwest. But there's one story I've never got around to telling. The interests of Oregon for today and in the future must be protected from grasping wastrels of the land. Oregon is a special place, a state of forests, streams, and open spaces. So I'm standing on the best of the best. You're standing right now on the best of the best. Well, so many parts of the country have been paved over, Oregon has held on to its pristine beauty. And that's because of a system that often goes unnoticed, but dictates every aspect of our lives, where and how we work, play, and sleep. Building that system took a confluence of political will and just the right moment. Preserving it has taken a generation of fights. He pulled a gun and he says, listen, you know, we're very serious about this and we want, we want to be able to develop land where we want to develop, we own it. We came back to the end of the road being in flames, fire trucks here. Well, when we came home, we thought, everything's gone. I want you to know how we got this way and how the way we manage our land 
could also help solve the biggest problems Oregon faces today. Things like the housing crisis, global warming, and racial inequality. Starting next week, OPB Politics Now will bring you a special series, Growing Oregon. I'll take you all over the state and deep into our history to understand how this special system got built and how it impacts all of our lives. That's starting next week, right here on OPB Politics Now. All right, let's get through with this. Uh, um, okay, maybe that was a little bit uh, uh, hyped. I mean, it, it wasn't really a true crime serial, but uh, it, it is an incredibly sweeping topic. and. and the something that that I really love about it is it touches on so many aspects of our modern life and of our country. And in fact, I want to take you back to the decades after World War II. And I know to many of you it seems like ancient history, but for me it was really much of my childhood. You know, our population, our economy, our, our sheer physical landscape changed more in those three decades, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, that at any time before or since. I mean, it was really, truly monumental. It set the template for how we live in modern America. Let's start with home building. The modern mass production techniques allowed the industry to churn out millions of affordable single-family suburban homes. Much of it are in farmlands that provided cheap, pre-leveled ground. Think of this. Through the 50s and 60s, an area the size of Rhode Island was turned from countryside to city and suburb every year. In the rush to build, developers raced to leapfrog onto cheaper land outside existing cities. After all, most Americans at this point had their own cars, so they were no longer tied to, uh, in a tight circle to their jobs. And, you know, this was progress. I mean, people were, were having a level of, of affluence that, that they had not ever seen, and particularly people missed during you know, those really tough years of the Depression and, uh, you know, an horrific world war. But even as, as we were seeing this progress, uh, many increasingly saw the downsides. Uh, you know, that, that it, it wasn't all, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, a bucolic lifestyle. Uh, here's one song I, I couldn't resist uh, putting in here, and I think just about everyone who was alive in the early 60s will remember this song. Little boxes on the hillside Little boxes made of kicky tacky Little boxes on the hillside Little boxes on the sand There's a pink one and a green one And a blue one and a yellow one And they're all made out of kicky tacky And they all look just the same Uh, the sprawling suburbanization of the United States played a big role in creating the modern environmental movement. I grew up in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and in those days, there was a brown pall that really hung over the bay on just about every sunny day. And, you know, that was, in fact, partially at least, a great deal, because of all these new suburbs where we were becoming a nation of commuters and loner in our cars. And it wasn't just air pollution. Developers often built on land with no sewer or water service, so septic tanks and wells became much more common. It's no coincidence that uh, uh, Irma Bombach, a very popular humorist from that period, uh, in her bestseller about life in the suburbs, was titled, uh, The Grass is Always Greener Over the Septic Tank. And, you know, anybody who's ever lived in a home with a septic tank knows how finicky they can be. The sewage and failing tanks could mix with well water, and Bombeck and her fellow uh, suburbanites, they used to joke about uh, what came out of their tap as being brown beer or detergent cocktails. And I, I don't know, I guess if you wise cracked your way through a world war, you know, you could joke about a little fecal matter in your water. But, um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the more serious side of it, of course, is that you know, uh, failing septic tanks can also spread hepatitis, typhoid, uh, dysentery, and, it, and this was a real problem. You know, uh, in uh, in Robert and I's area, the mid part of Multnomah County was the largest unsewered 
uh, developed uh, uh, urban area in the United States at one point, uh, as late as what, the 70s, I believe, or the 80s. So it's, it's serious stuff. It was the loss of the countryside uh, as, that I really noticed most as a child growing up in the California. Uh, my dad uh, was, was a long time, uh, you know, lived uh, his entire life in the Bay Area uh, and used to complain bitterly about seeing the hills that were his natural backdrop suddenly covered with houses. And even many of the people in these new homes would complain about even newer homes that destroyed their sense that they had moved to a country setting. One new California suburbanite, seven-year-old Scott Turner, wrote a letter, it's up there, to President John F. Kennedy complaining that he could no longer play in an unspoiled canyon because of, of uh, development. <coughs> Excuse me. His plea was to protect open space, or rather, his plea to protect open space made newspapers around the country. The Kennedy administration responded to Scott that it was trying to preserve lands just for roaming around by yourself. Uh, Sadly, that's not the advice you'd give a seven-year-old today, but um, that's, that's another story. But, but these complaints were particularly resonant in Oregon. You know, during World War II, or, or before World War II, the rest of the, uh, or, or the, the Northwest was really more isolated than, than most of the country, but in the decades following the war, Oregon had, had, had some of the highest growth rates and, and Oregonians really feared that, uh, you know, their magnificent landscape I was talking about was under threat. And they only had to look south to California to see what could happen where, you know, post-war uh, growth was even more rapid and intense. You know, I went to school at, in San Jose State University in Santa Clara County, and that was a county that once was one of the preeminent fruit packing uh, or growing and packing regions in the country. I mean, it was replete with, with orchards, and by the time I went to school there in the 70s, it was wall-to-wall -wall houses, parking lots, freeways. Uh, there was the, the tech industry coming in. Nobody called it Silicon Valley yet, but everybody sort of wondered, what happened? Did we really plan any of this? No, it just sort of seemed to grow up around us. And I think in Oregon, nobody channeled this uh, this feeling that Oregon was in danger of losing something fundamental than Tom McCall. In 1962, the TV reporter and commentator for KGW aired a hour-long documentary called Pollution in Paradise, and it really galvanized the state. He called out big air and water polluters by name, and he also stressed how authorities just couldn't keep up with growth driving so much of this pollution. All but final research proof has been found <laughs> to establish the link between inadequate sewage systems and water pollution and an incidence of that serious disease, hepatitis, more prevalent in Oregon than in a majority of the 50 states. That was pretty scary stuff. And, you know, you can still watch this, uh, this documentary, Google it on YouTube. And uh, it did help spark tighter state water pollution controls. And it helped McCall, who had been a previously failed congressional candidate, jump back into politics. He became governor just four years later, proclaiming that quality of life was Oregon's big challenge. You know, McCall was the kind of liberal Republican who once dominated Oregon politics. And in fact, it was, it was fascinating from this time because the, the political boundaries were so, so different then. And there were just so many or, uh, Republicans and Democrats alike who made growth and quality of life their signature issues. Much of this fervor was in the Willamette Valley, which then and now has about two-thirds of Oregon's population and, and hence most of the population pressures. And it's also the heart of Oregon's agricultural industry. So, you know, it was really right at the nexus of, of what we were doing. I mean, there were conferences, dire reports, local action. Uh, officials in the Salem area created an urban growth boundary. That's where uh, Norma Paulus, she later was the first woman to be nominated by a major party, the Republicans, for Oregon governor, started her political career as a member of the commission that created that boundary. In 1969, McCall presented a package of bills to the legislature uh, to guide development in the state. Legislators responded by passing one of the measures, Senate Bill 10. 
It required counties to zone all of their lands with a focus on protecting farmlands, discouraging leapfrog development, and more. It was really pretty pioneering at the time, and it told you there was public appetite for action. But Senate Bill 10 didn't work as well as supporters hoped. It was too easy for counties to evade making real change, you know, making the zoning decisions that would anger big landowners or developers. It, it was much easier to just say, well, we'll kind of put zoning on it that's what it's doing now or what somebody wants to do with it. You know, there was always somebody with an enticing development plan that didn't necessarily fit the goals of, you know, more efficient, compact growth. Um, <clears throat> at the time, uh, Congress was, I mean, it, w it was a different environment at the time in Congress, and which was in the middle of an extraordinary run of environmental legislation that also had bipartisan support. They'd passed clean air and water bills, established the Environmental Protection Agency, protected endangered species, much more. And many saw some sort of national planning bill as really the next logical step toward protecting the environment. The Nixon administration, which might surprise many people, actually made a run at land use planning. As it happened, John Ehrlichman, the top Nixon domestic advisor, went to prison in the Watergate scandal. He'd actually been a land use lawyer in Seattle, so he had an interest in the subject. Uh, several key Democrats also latched on to the issue. The uh, White House issued this report that influenced activists around the country and in Oregon called The Quiet Revolution in Land Use Control. It um, really had a lot of interesting case studies. I was interested in one from California talking about saving San Francisco Bay, which when I was growing up as a kid, many people were worried it would just turn into an inlet for the Sacramento River. You know, that you'd see Save the Bay bumper stickers on cars all over the place. But the, the whole national planning effort collapsed. And I think, once again, at the national level, it was just seen as threatening to, to so many powerful interests. <coughs> but Oregon continued to plug away at the issue. Tom McCall wouldn't let it go. And like I say, there was a lot of public support. Backers included the Oregon League of Women Voters, the Ralph Nader-inspired Oregon Student Public Interest Research Group. Farmers were a very important part of this coalition, or Oregon Environmental Council, and th there were many more. And their attitude really was, let's take charge of how we want to go grow. And, and you also had a lot of legislators who wouldn't let it go. I mean, not only did politicians see it as a good issue, I mean, it was something that really uh, inspired a lot of them. Norma Paulus, by this point, was in the House. And a Corvallis area farmer named Hector McPherson was in the Senate. More than any other person, McPherson deserves to be called the farmer, father of Oregon's land use planning system. You know, he's one of these farmer intellectuals, a guy who carefully studied modern techniques of dairy farmer, but he was also a voracious reader of politics and policy. And he said it quickly became clear to him that Senate bill wasn't going to do enough. With McCall aides, he began working on a much tougher bill that they eventually aimed for the 1973 session. By this time, Democrats had controlled, control, gained control of both houses, so McPherson, a Republican, wasn't going to run any committees. But he partnered with Democratic Senator Ted Halleck of Portland, and uh, he was also a very interesting guy, where McPherson was more calm and deliberative, Halleck was fiery and emotional, but they made a really good team. McPherson was the policy maven. Halleck was the guy who strategized how to get the bill moving. And uh, he, he would say years later that many of the, his own party leaders, uh, the Democratic Senate president for one, really wanted the bill to just kind of die a quiet death. He didn't want to oppose it, just didn't want it to go anywhere. And, uh, you know, the fact was, was a, as I said before, a very difficult issue. There was a lot of opposition, cities and counties worried about a loss of control. Many landowners worried what it would do to their bottom line. You know, some critics saw land use planning as akin to com communism. And remember, we were in the middle of the Cold War at this time. At any rate, Halleck and McPherson uh, concluded that Senate Bill 100 needed to be rewritten. And here's where another key figure comes into play. 
LB Day was a Teamsters official and former legislator from Salem. He was asked to chair a small work group comprised of some key lobbyists to come up with a bill that could pass. Under Day's direction, the group developed a bill that was more a framework from land use planning than the full-fledged system we know today. It created a seven-member Land Conservation and Development Commission, District, commission excuse me, that would draft the system's goals and oversee them. You know, and I have to say, looking back 50 years, I, I can just imagine how Senate Bill 100 could have turned into another hollow bill. I've covered the legislature long enough to give you plenty examples of widely heralded, re heralded reforms that turn, uh, end up you know, being far less than advertised. But what's important about Senate Bill 100 is it was the beginning of a process that really uh, took several years to complete, but it did you know, obviously lead to a, a very complete system. Um, McCall signed the bill into law on May 29th, 1973. So if you want to observe the 50th anniversary, you still have another month to get ready. Um, and McCall actually gave LB Day another job, a more important job, to head uh, the LCDC, as it came, came to be known. And the commission held dozens of listening sessions around the state to gather public input on just what the goals should be. It was said to be one of the biggest public outreach efforts in Oregon history. One thing that really strikes me about those sessions is how it laid bare the tension between planning for growth and keeping things the same, you know, and I think that's a struggle we still have in Oregon. You know, and remember that the most uh, famous thing that Tom McCall ever said was, please visit Oregon, but don't stay. Uh, he later said he just meant that he wanted the state to grow wisely, but you can also argue he was catering to a populist, you know, sort of pull up the drawbridge over the moat sediment sentiment. Uh, ironically, uh, I think he encouraged a lot of people to move here because uh, they were so intrigued by a governor telling them not to come to Oregon. Um, I, I, through the years, I've met more than one person who, who said that. At any rate, the commission eventually adopted 19 goals. They called for protecting prime farm lands wherever possible in a careful process of urbanization. Perhaps the most important was adoption of an urban growth boundary. That's something to, to understand. There was nothing about urban growth boundaries that was in Senate Bill 100. Uh, and these, of course, are an invisible and movable line that is drawn around every uh, Oregon city and, of course, around the entire Portland region. And, and one goal that was really inserted at the last moment particularly intrigued me. Known as Goal 10, it required local governments to make room for housing uh, affordable to Oregonians of every income level. Essentially, it outlaws exclusionary zoning. That's where you require such things as large lots and other rules aimed at keeping out the not so well to do. I love this particular line from the, uh, that housing goal. Or, I'm sorry, this is from the LCDC decision uh, uh, upholding a ruling uh, against the small city of Durham saying that their zoning violated Goal 10. And uh, the, the language in the ruling, I think, is very interesting. The, the housing goal clearly says that municipalities are not going to be able to do what they have done in metropolitan areas in the rest of the country. They are not going to be able to pass the housing buck to their neighbors on the assumption that some other community will open its doors and take in the teachers, police, firemen, clerks, secretaries, and other ord ordinary goal folk who can't afford homes in the towns where they work. It's a pretty, uh, what would you say, utopian goal, and certainly I can point you to many examples where we haven't lived up to that, but uh, I think it's something very important to keep in mind as we're struggling to deal with uh, the whole affordable uh, housing issue, in fact, providing housing for everybody. Um, with the approval of the new goals at the end of 1974, you now have a fully fledged program, something you know you could certainly argue about. This was no longer just a, a potentially hollow bill. And boy, did Oregonians. Many rural counties strongly resisted approving local plans. Uh, the name LCDC, and, or the abbreviation LCDC in some quarters, was turned into a curse word. Opponents launched 
ballot initiatives to gut the program in 1976 and 1978. Both times voters said they wanted to keep you know, the strong planning rules. It should be noted that in both those elections, the yes vote was carried uh, because of its popularity in the Portland area and the rest of the Willamette Valley. And that is something that you know is really important in making in in why the political uh, the the program succeeded is sort of this um, um, coalition between uh, both the farmers and in the farm communities of the Willamette Valley, of course the larger cities too, and the uh, Portland area. And then came the hard times in the early 1980s. The Federal Reserve raised interest rates to sky-high levels to combat inflation. If you think interest rates are high now, you haven't seen anything. And that sent Oregon into a very deep recession. Construction had collapsed, and the timber industry laid off thousands of workers here. Suddenly, growth was no longer the big issue. Oregon was losing population. Many business leaders proclaimed that Oregon needed to show it was open to business, these land use regulations, they said, were off-putting. Supporters, including some key people in the high-tech industry that Oregon was working hard to attract, argued that the new planning system was actually a help. They said it gave more certainty on where they could develop. Tom McCall was out of office and sadly dying of cancer. But he proclaimed that his last political act would be to persuade voters to keep the unique system so many had worked hard to produce. And on election night, 55% of voters agreed with him. And uh, you know, just a few months later, he died. But he went knowing that, uh, that the system he helped to create would be allowed to survive and grow. I can't say that's a neat and tidy end of the land use story. I think this system is much too complicated for that. And in fact, my segue to Robert Liberty is to mention that he began his career at 1,000 Friends of Oregon. Did, was that mentioned in the introduction? Probably. Um, and uh, that group played such a fundamental role in how the law was interpreted. And I suspect uh, he might just uh, explain to you how he got tired of winning so much. <laughs> and with that, thank you very much. And I guess I'm audible now? Yes. All right. Well, they're going to queue up the PowerPoint. And thank you, Jeff, for that summary of a very long, complex, and highly contentious uh, 50 years. I entered into it about 42 years ago. And I was smiling at the image of Ted Halleck. This is a digression. Uh, and you are not going to be bathed in a warm bath of nostalgia, because I have way too many stories. And I really want to talk about what we've accomplished. but. Uh, about 25 years ago, we were celebrating the 25th anniversary of 1,000 Friends. It was founded on the anniversary of the passage of Senate Bill 100 with Tom McCall's support. And I had someone go interview Ted Halleck. He was a young uh, college student. And he came back with these tapes, and it was so laced with profanity. I said, how are we going to use this? And I don't mean light profanity. I mean <laughs> dense, hardcore, rigorous <laughs> profanity. So we talked about how to edit this, and finally, it was this young man, is, uh, his father was a friend of mine. We talked about, well, should we just quote it and take out the words? And he said, this is part of history, you quote it the way he said it. So there are a few remaining tapes that have these segments in it. <laughs> but even I balked at some of the things he said because I thought, oh, because they were about people who were still alive then. So maybe we can talk about it now because they're <laughs> fortunately gone on to a better planned location. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Uh, I want to talk about uh, what we accomplished in 50 years. We set very ambitious goals for ourselves. Uh, so how did we do? Well, the first thing I want to say is Oregon is not Oz. I'm sorry, it's not perfect. The planning program is not perfect. My 42-year career in Oregon has been focused on all its imperfections. That said, what we've accomplished here, I think, is actually remarkable at a national scale. So as uh, Jeff mentioned, one of our goals was replacing leapfrog low-density sprawl, the primary pattern of development in the middle of the last century, with compact urban development, clearly separating the city from the country. 
How did we do? Well, this is a map of all the urban growth boundaries in Oregon from about 20 years ago now. And every city has an urban growth boundary. And there's a couple cities in Oregon that have a population smaller than this room. And they have urban growth boundaries. So this made sense every place, everywhere. And I'm going to use a lot of examples from the Portland metro region because it's the best studied, both uh, by people in Oregon but nationally, uh, although I'll have some references to other parts of the state. On this satellite image, you can pretty much pick out the urban growth boundary, just as if you were from low orbit. There it is, and if we look at uh, two little segments of it, this is what it looks like from above, and almost shockingly apparent. In fact, I had someone from Michigan, when she saw this, she started laughing, and I said, why are you laughing? And she said, well, she was from Lansing. She said, uh, I knew you talked about urban growth boundary, but I didn't think it looked like a cartoon. <laughs> But this is in Lafayette, which is in the northern Willamette Valley, and you don't need a line drawn on the map to see where the urban growth boundary is. This is Joseph in Wallowa County in the far northeast. Again, you can see the urban growth boundary. Sisters, the iconic view from Sisters to the Three Sisters, the mountains, uh, this is made possible by this urban growth boundary. And although a little harder to see, but you can see this in Redmond, and you can see it in Bend. This is a figure ground. A figure ground is a term that architects use, and everything in black is a building or a structure. Uh, this was published about four years ago. And you can see the urban growth boundary for Portland, for Newburgh, for Dundee, for Estacada, for Sandy, without any line being drawn, just showing the buildings. This is a remarkable uh, evidence that the program is working in a really dramatic way. By contrast, this is Charlotte, North Carolina a metropolitan region about the same size, growing at the same rate as Portland. And it's pretty much like you took city and country and put it into a blender. In California, where I did some work for a couple of years uh, on uh, reforming their uh, transportation land use uh, policies, compact urban form is one of the key uh, strategies for reducing greenhouse gases. So it's pretty simple. If things are close together, and they're close together, you can use transit, you emit less pollution that's changing our climate. So California is trying to catch up and replicate a pattern of growth we already have in Oregon. So it's directly related to climate change. Now, I will say this, because I did have the, if you can call it, the fun of spending two years looking at all efforts to curtail sprawl in all 50 states, yes, including Wyoming, uh, and at the local and regional level. So I got to look at what every other state had done. And it helped me understand what Oregon had done. So this strategy of having a clear line that separates city and country, protecting the countryside for its value for farming, for forestry, natural resources, and having compact growth has been replicated in other places as diverse as Frankenmuth, a town and township in Michigan, uh, Lexington, Kentucky, which had the first urban growth boundary in the United States, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Davis, another place in, in California. And you can go on Google Earth and see the same pattern. But Oregon's the only one that's done it at a state level. Jeff has talked about this, and this is a little known, but really uh, one of the most impressive achievements of the Oregon planning program. And he's told you a little bit about the history. Uh, and he saved me a little time and explanations. But one of the things that people assume wrongly about Senate Bill 100 is, well, it was for middle-class white people so they could preserve the landscape to look at. But it had no equity component. This is a photograph of Tom McCall in 1955 speaking on the issue of housing access for African Americans in Portland. Well, it's not the only time he spoke on this subject. So for Tom McCall and other people involved in the program, right from the beginning, were concerned about how cities grew, uh, whether there was an equity component. They didn't call it that. But one of the first and biggest targets was exclusionary zoning. So this is an illustration of it from today. This is the zoning map for Scarsdale and Westchester County outside New York. And um, I expect you to memorize that legend. We'll have a quiz on it at the end. But what I will tell you is that all of this, all the blue and green and gray, is for lots from a third of an acre to an acre in size. There is a little area zone for small lots, 5,000 square foot lots. It's so small, you can barely pick it out. It's in the upper left-hand corner. 
Uh, and this means that if you work in, in Scarsdale as a teacher or a policeman or a clerk in the bank or in the store, you can't live there. And that's not the free market, that is regulation. So regulation through zoning was intended to separate people by income and therefore directly or indirectly by race and ethnicity and national origin. This is not some woke reworking of history at all. This is explicit in planning manuals. It's explicit called out. The Supreme Court in California analogized apartment buildings to nuisances and sources of disease because that's where poor people and immigrants lived and they would diminish the property value of the people who lived in the nice houses in the big lots. So this was explicitly done to separate us by class, by income, and therefore by race. And the connection with race in California has to do with Asians, not African Americans, but it's very stark when you read the history. So Durham, which you heard a quote from the uh, decision, the hearings officer decision, by the way, that man is still alive and very active. Uh, Durham in 1977 was a suburb of Portland, about 600 population, and it was zoned for 30 acre lots and 8,000 square foot lots. And the occasion for this litigation, Seaman v. Durham, was that they were going to decrease the density, and they said explicitly it was to avoid inner city problems, which is code language. Now, think about it. Inner city is Portland, right? I was living in Portland at the time. It's not exactly Cabrini Green. Uh, but anyway, this is what was challenged. And what is the nice end of the story is, and uh, there's a lot of interesting diesel, like one of the opponents of the change in zoning moved into multifamily housing as he got older. But Durham now has 40% of its housing as multifamily. 38% are minorities. It's not a low-income suburb. The median household income is $80,000. But it has become a mixed uh, uh, community, mixed in race, mixed in income, because the regulations that reduced the choice of housing were removed. And it was the focus point and the first big challenge uh, and the implementation of Senate Bill uh, 100 on uh, Goal 10, and it's a remarkable story. Uh, the result over the years was expressed in this headline by Betsy Hammond in 2002. That's the actual headline in the Oregonian, back when it was a newspaper. Um, <laughs> income groups intermingle. This was unprecedented, I think, in the United States, and it was there was a lot more housing choice in suburbs. Now, I'm not talking about something that's beautiful or the most wonderful place in the world, but the fact was that people could live in the suburbs and find lots of apartment buildings. In fact, the amount of land zoned for apartments tripled in four years. The average minimum lot size for single-family homes went from a quarter of an acre back down to about 5,500 square feet. So we have problems again today with economic segregation, housing prices, but you won't find a headline like this in any other paper. And Bend itself, uh, and I started coming here when I was a child and, you know, bemoaning the fact that dinosaurs had recently died out. But um, <laughs> what you see in Bend now is a direct result of the planning program. This would not be happening, I believe, without the planning program. More diversity of housing, including uh, income, uh, restricted housing in the lower left-hand corner. So there's quite a change going on here. I know it's never been easy, it never will be easy, but it's very important for our future. It's always been controversial. This is a sign from Portland. Uh, and of course, in 2019, the Oregon legislature went further and pretty much changed single family zoning for every city over 10,000, most cities uh, over 25,000 dramatically. No other state has done that. <clears throat> and some states are never gonna do that. This is a headline from the New York Times, story from the New York Times. I mean, you look at those guys in the front row and you think, what decade is this? <laughs> That picture was taken this year. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, uh, speaking of dinosaurs, I, um, I worked on accessory dwelling units for AARP and legislation, and New York turned down the authorization of accessory dwelling units, which is like a pretty small step. So did Massachusetts. The good news is, and surprising news, that in Helena, capital of Montana, last Thursday, they passed a law called the Montana State Planning Act, and for the seven most populous counties in the state, the cities in those counties have to do pretty much what Oregon has done. Now, I told my clients there, I said, don't tell them, but it looks like they borrowed a bunch of stuff from Oregon. <laughs> 
it passed the state house 94 to 5. So it was, uh, now unfortunately, they omitted one thing as they left out all the counties and all the rural land protection, but it's progress. Conserving rural lands for farming, ranching, and forestry, and this is often seen as the summary is, oh, we protected farmland. Uh, and I have to make a correction. One of the things Oregon did was uh, widen the protection way beyond prime farmland. It was a lot of land that is good for ranching in large scale, but if we had protected prime farmland, very little of Oregon's farmland, including the Willamette Valley's prime farmland, the places where the grapes grow, where the grass seed grows, none of that is prime, not even close. So all that land is valuable. So uh, this is a map, again, that would make someone from Texas' head explode. It's um, generalized zoning maps. The dark green is forest zoning, the yellow is farm zoning, and the intermediate shade is mixed farm forest. So we have 25 million acres of land. It's 96% 90, of the private land in Oregon is in one of these zones. No other state has come close to doing that. And you can't do this through land conservancies. So um, this is a signal achievement. And there is a tendency to think that land east of the Cascades is not valuable. That is not true. In fact, the volcanoes, which are on your horizon, are great fertilizers. Uh, this was really evident after the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens where there were record crops. Unfortunately, in Washington State, you couldn't harvest them because all your equipment was destroyed by the ash. <laughs> Uh, but it is a long time, it's known as a long time source of soil fertility. So Eastern Oregon grows cherries, apples, uh, wheat, barley, uh, cattle, onions, peas, a long list of commodities. It's a very important part of Oregon agriculture. And the grazing land is, uh, supports the industry that's still very vibrant here. Um, this is another table you have to memorize along with a legend from Scarsdale. But what it shows, this is research done for uh, Western Oregon by Oregon State University researcher uh, Letman, who is still active today, it shows a dramatic drop in the conversion of farmland, not just to subdivisions, but also to low density development. <clears throat> and forest land, and people tend to forget about private forest land in Oregon. It's not just public land, it's private land. It, when I was growing up, it supported a very big industry. That's no longer true due to modernization primarily. But on planet Earth, there are not many temperate rainforests that can produce what these lands can produce. And the Ponderosa pine forests are also remarkable and remarkably productive. And again, and the inflection points a little later, and that's a lecture in itself, but a big drop in the conversion of forest land. And there's updated uh, versions of these studies that show this is continuing and very different than our neighbor to the north in Washington. This is some research done by a group in Seattle, and each red dot represents 10 people. On the left is the decade of the 1990s, and on the right is the first decade of the 21st century. So there's one metropolitan region divided by a state line and a river, and look at the difference. Just remarkably different. And by the way, it is not true that there aren't urban growth boundaries and farmland protection in Washington. Vancouver itself has an urban growth boundary, but it's way too big. They have farmland protection, but there's a lot of houses being built. There's a secondary benefit to these uh, rural lands protections, which is even as they're used for farming and ranching uh, <clears throat> and forestry, they are still provide important values for wildlife habitat, as wildlife habitat, source of water, and maintaining some ecological integrity. Yes, there's a lot of tension between farming, ranching, forestry, and these values, but there's a big difference long-term between a clear cut and a subdivision. So I've talked about what was accomplished, and, uh, but how exactly, what made the difference? And Jeff touched on some of this, the fact that Senate Bill 10 didn't work. By the way, we voted on, on our planning program seven times, seven times. No other state has done that. So whenever you hear Oregon's top-down planning, it's like, oh, how many times did your state vote on your plan for your state? Oh, you don't have a plan, that's right. <laughs> well, here are my reasons for success kind of boiled down. Uh, this is the most important one. For most governments in the United States, planning is a process that culminates in a plan. So the purpose of planning is to produce a plan. In Oregon, planning is a process that culminates in a place. That is a fundamental difference. We aimed at an outcome 
and adopted the planning program to achieve that outcome. This sounds so obvious to be stupid, but I can tell you, in most of the United States, the focus is on the production of the document. Here are some elements of why it's effective. It's mandatory and binding planning. This is not optional, it's not advisory, you have to do it. And you have to achieve very specific goals. And all the goals, not all the goals, but the goals that were very clear and specific are the ones we achieve the most in uh, realizing our vision. And we have to have objective regulations. I say this as a former hearings officer. Uh, we gave up on the idea that local control is the best control. Uh, in fact, Governor McCall in his speech to the legislature did refer specifically to Jefferson County. He said, where the speculators, the speculators have outrun the capacity for rational control. He was a great one with words. Um, and so <clears throat> local control sounds nice as some sort of abstract idea of democracy, but if you look at the results around the United States, it's like, well, what is the result? So Oregon decided the outcome was more important than who made the decisions, and so the state had to step in. And I say that as someone who sued the state of Oregon for decades. <laughs> Strong and specialized judicial land use, uh, judicial oversight. We're the only state that has a land use court. Its role is remarkable, fast decisions, easy access for citizens who are not lawyers, high record of uh, uh, affirmation of their decisions. It's something that actually be transplanted to many other states. And this last point is really important. Uh, the role of citizens, nonprofits, and businesses in monitoring enforcement, defense, and improvement. Why did people do this? Because the program was delivering results, so it was important to be engaged. If you're in a state where planning is advisory, why go to those meetings? It's not gonna make any difference. If it does make a difference, then by golly, you wanna be part of it. All right, uh, I'd like to talk, even though it wasn't really part of the agenda, about the next 50 years. Um, what do we need to do? Well, let's talk about urban areas first. We've all heard this phrase, reduce, reuse, recycle. We apply that to materials. We need to apply it to cities. I think our goal should be all future urban development is by reuse, infill, and redevelopment. No net loss of rural lands. Now, that may seem shocking to you, but actually we've come a long way toward that, and the legacy of all the sprawl in the, in the 20th century is we have huge amounts of land available for better uses in our urban areas. So let's uh, take an example from the Portland metro area. So between 1979 and 2016, 37 years, the acreage expanded by 14%, and as one of the decision makers uh, on urban growth plan expansions, that's too much, I can tell you that's too much. But the population increased by 73%. Uh, this is, uh, there's a little rounding error in there so it may confuse you, but this is location of new homes in the Portland metro area over a 10 year period when there's a lot of growth. Infill and redevelopment are 76%, 75%. So new homes on vacant land was only a quarter. So we only have a quarter to go to have all the new homes built on land that's already been surrounded by development or partly developed, or to make better use of the homes we already have. And here's an example from uh, Corvallis. Uh, pick one of the polygons. Doesn't matter which one, just pick one. Look at the date, 1994. Corvallis had a population of 46,700. And now we go forward 24 years. Same edge. Okay, and the population's grown 24% during that time. So yes, we can do this. We can have urbanization without taking one more acre of rural lands. Um, there's been a lot of progress at the local level here in Bend in particular. It's notable in giving people more transportation choices. I was a bike commuter for most of my, almost all my career actually. Um, because it was easy, safe, and convenient, which is why it, when it's made easy, safe, and convenient, Americans will do it. It's not a matter of culture. It's a matter of the design of the community. And then when we have more compact development with more uh, mixture of, of commercial uses, it makes transit work better. But at the state level, we are still in 1973 when the Oregon T Department of Transportation was created the same year as Senate Bill 100. <clears throat> I'm gonna give you an example. Many of you have heard about the project of the new bridge over the Columbia River. 
It's not really about a bridge. So what you see here is looking south, and uh, there's no Columbia River, that's the North Portland Slough. This is what's proposed. Yeah, so this is a revival of a project from 15 years ago as a Metro Council. That project will cost 7.5, up to between five and 7.5 billion dollars. The primary beneficiary are people living in the suburban edge north of Vancouver. It will save maybe 10 or 15 minutes off their commute on Friday. That's what you and I will be paying for. Now for $500 million, according to the Department of Transportation, we can bring every bridge on the state highway system in Oregon up to good condition. Every single bridge. Why is 10 minutes off a commute from Battleground more important than five minutes off a bus ride in Bend? So we have a big problem. We, we have not really integrated, we have not met our goal of creating more transportation choices. That's number two. The third is, although we've saved a lot of farmland, in fact, uh, since 1983, 34,000 new homes. New homes have been built in farm, forest, uh, and rangelands. That's enough for everyone in Bend. Think about that. 34,000 new homes in the land we're supposedly saving for farming and for forestry. This is not a long-range plan to save farmland. We've also allowed commercial development of different types in some of the most productive farmlands. I love this quote. It's from a national tourism magazine from, I think, uh, late last year. Oregon wine country has become a lovely alternative of Napa Valley. It's much more affordable and considerably less touristy. Well, that's going to be news for people in, uh, around McMinnville and in the Hood River Valley because it's becoming Napa Valley. And it's not really a place where you can farm. If there's a wedding going on next door, it's pretty hard to operate if your neighbors are bringing phylloxera over from the gift shop. Uh, so we need to rethink our, what these lands are really valuable for. And this is part of a bigger issue of rural gentrification displacement. Now we hear about urban gentrification displacement. This is what's happening in the countryside. So if you can make five times uh, as much money by a short-term rental in the countryside, you start building them for that purpose. And I, I'm working in an area outside Bozeman uh, where short-term rentals are replacing all the housing. So it's driving up housing costs and it's converting the countryside into Disneyland. We cannot continue on this path. We need to address and halt rural gentrification displacement. In all these things, I've given examples of how equity, fairness to people of all different backgrounds can be integrated, whether it's on transportation choices or access to farming jobs and the ability to begin in agriculture without competing with a short-term rental. I think that can be a theme. We have not done a good job in protecting wildlife and ecosystems. Uh, I think that's statistically true, and there's reasons about that. But this is a big part of Oregon. We share Oregon with these plants and animals. It wouldn't be the same place if they're gone. Uh, and we need to do better with that. Integrating water and land use planning, it's kind of obvious, but we didn't do it, even though we had a goal that said we were going to do that. And finally, there's bipartisanship again in the Oregon legislature, but it's between Democrats and Republicans passing bad land use legislation. The Democratic Party has lost its rural roots, and it's become a very urban party, and the Republican Party has become more extreme and hostile to government generally. So we have really bad bills being passed and proposed by Democrats and Republicans in Salem now, including Senate Bill 4, which gives the governor kind of unilateral authority to basically expand urban growth boundaries and rezone land without judicial review. To me, that doesn't even sound like a democracy, let alone Oregon. And we're doing this chasing after jobs when we have record high uh, employment and housing's unaffordable. So this does not make sense to me. And McCall had a very famous quote about Oregon not being a shameless hussy chasing after every smokestack. We should focus on quality and not just quantity. So what about your role? Because uh, a lot of you are engaged in this, will be engaged in this. I look to the people in the room without any gray hair. <laughs> so I met remarkable people who were not famous at all, who should be famous, who made this program work. So this is Cliff Lamb. One of the reasons that Oregon's private forest lands have not been chopped in, into 20-acre home sites, probably the biggest reason as one person is this man, Cliff Lamb, school teacher, no background in planning, 
Lane County Tree Farmer of the Year. This is Mike McCarthy, still active in the Hood River Valley, trying to keep orchards land intact, trying to push back the effort to commercialize the land. And his pears uh, are turned into brandy. <laughs> Marguerite Watkins, a remarkable woman, uh, lived in a very modest house in Coos Bay, not far from the port. One of the reasons you can participate in Land Use Board of Appeals is Marguerite Watkins, who made it a personal crusade to protect your right to challenge land use decisions in the face. She had a lot of hostility with her county commissioners, the amount of abuse this woman took. She took it all very calmly. She was, she was a, a remarkable woman. Roy Hearn, um, I hope I'm not doing a dis service, although he died a couple of years ago, but I'm not sure he finished high school. Cattle rancher, one-man band in Baker County, stopping uh, new homes, new land divisions, and uh, lots of great stories about him. He decided to take this on on himself, wasn't a big-time rancher, and like I say, he was so good that he gave me advice on land use proceedings in the county. Gene Pekarik, very much still with us, if you've been to Wallawa Lake, on the Marines, those were planned for development, residential development, resort development. Jean, more than any other person, stopped that. What's her background? Social services. Uh, some of you might know him. Jim Wood, he's a veterinarian near Post. He's been working to keep the rangelands in Crook County uh, from being chopped up and uh, houses built on it. Very active with Thousand Friends of Oregon. Uh, two of my favorite farmers, Mickey Killingsworth and Gary Harris. Uh, Gary on the right, uh, very high in the Republican Party, served in the Land Conservation Development Commission. Mickey Killingsworth, who's on the Farm Bureau Hall of Fame. Uh, there is a proposal to build a giant resort near Smith Rock State Park on very productive farmland. Gary knows that, because uh, he told me once, you know, those little carrots you get at restaurants, you know, on your salad bar, he said, good chance that's from the seed grown on our one farm huge, hugely valuable productive land, which people call desert and scrub. And down there in the lower left, they're celebrating. And this bill was supported, by the way, by John Kitzhaber. Uh, but thanks to this kind of work, it didn't happen. And finally, this is uh, the guy with the red tabs on his jacket is uh, apparently my grandson now. But um, this is the Alliance for Responsible Land Use in Deschutes County 30 years ago deciding to challenge the way decisions were being made in the county. And the woman with the black uh, sweater in the upper left is Jen Twining. I don't know if she's still with us. Psychiatric nurse, uh, no background land use planning, spark plug, who really uh, made a huge difference. And quite an interesting cast of characters around her who formed that predecessor to Central Oregon Land Watch. And of course, the people and the sponsor, the people in this room, the sponsors, for this program and the organizations are carrying on that work today. This is the, the real secret ingredient to the planning program. McCall said this, heroes are not statues framed against a red sky. They are people who say, this is my community and it's my responsibility to make it better. That's you, you're all our heroes. Thank you. See, it's on, okay. Well, that was fantastic. I, I enjoyed that. I hope you all did too. Um, we have some time. How much time have we got, Valerie? 20 minutes for questions from the audience. I have some seed questions, but I bet you guys have some even better ones. So put your hand up and I'll bring you the mic. Let me see. Ah, oh, you're going to make me walk. I'll be <laughs> exercise today. Hi, um, so I have a question about the, the history of this a little bit. You talk about the exclusionary zoning from the past where we didn't end up with some of those, um, you know, some of the kinds of zoning you get in the Northeast with these one acre lots and such, but a lot of suburban Oregon, I grew up in Eugene, uh, live in Bend, it looks pretty similar. You know, you have like these single family units. We've outlawed things like, uh, corner stores uh, in, in a lot of our suburbs. So superficially, it looks pretty similar in this, this kind of suburban development pattern. And we didn't really get until HB 2001 and just a few years back, 
um, a real re-legalization of some of these more denser forms of housing. So when they were putting all this together, did they kind of, what, what were they seeing? You know, because they, they're, they're going to say like, okay, we're not going to grow out. That's great. I, I agree with that. Um, but they didn't really legalize growing up and in quite, quite as much as, as we've finally started to, to do recently. Well, if I may, um, I think one reason you're asking that question is because you're from Eugene. I'm serious. There was a lot of, my neighborhood has changed dramatically, and not as a result of House Bill 2001 and 2019, but of what happened in the 1980s. I mean, dramatic changes. So, uh, and not just in Portland, but there are 25 old streetcar routes in Portland. You can, I can name them. You go along, there's four and five story buildings built in the last 15 or 20 years. Thousands of units of housing, partly because parking requirements were moved. Dramatic change. The second thing is the suburban development pattern in Washington County is dramatically different than it was. Now, when you talk about the existing suburban areas, I'd like to talk about that because that's one of the frontiers for change. When my parents moved to the what were the suburbs in 1961, they moved into a uh, split-level ranch house. And it had on the, the daylight ground floor a wet bar and a TV room, a bedroom, and a bathroom. I've thought about that house a lot because it's pretty common house type. That can be a duplex easily and inexpensively. The second thing is adding commercial uses. Uh, in other cities, they have been introducing commercial uses, having a lot more flexibility in the zoning. But development uh, occurs in existing communities is, has been slower. You can find areas where the change, like in the, the places I mentioned, Portland, have been very fast. I do think the next change, and the reason I talked about reduce, reuse, recycle, is we need to repurpose homes. There's a lot of seniors who want to stay in their homes, can't afford to stay in them, allowing them as law allows uh, to convert them to duplexes and uh, is a good way of doing that. One other thing I'll say about accessory dwelling units, um, we have one on our, we have a pretty small house. Uh, the main floor is 850 square feet and there's a finished attic and the unfinished basement. We now have an apartment downstairs. It costs $75,000, so it's not that expensive to do, and it's long-term rental. In our neighborhood, there's probably four or five on every block. So invisible from the outside is the number of housing units has gone up significantly. So I think things can change. I think things will change. With prices high, I think they'll continue to change. Eugene government has been resistant to a lot of this, and it kind of stands out, actually, <laughs> in Oregon. It's not alone, but Jeff? Yeah, I, I think one thing that is important to uh, understand, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. yeah, I think one thing that is important to understand, though, is there is a lot of public resistance. You know, I, uh, when I was doing this series, I kept running across different people uh, who claimed to be the father of this expression, but you know, there's nothing that Oregonians hate more than sprawl than density. And, um, it, and, and there is a real dilemma that um, even in Portland, I've talked to, to many people. They, uh, like most of the city, are on the political left, and they are not happy about the increasing density they see. They, they miss more of a small town feel that there used to be. And, um, of course, there's often huge resistance in neighborhoods that are more well-to-do. Uh, look what ha was happening in the East Moreland yeah. neighborhood where they are having huge fights over uh, basically trying to declare themselves as a historic neighborhood so that they don't have to allow the change that uh, Robert is talking about. And I think this is, this is going to be a, a huge issue in Oregon over the next several uh, decades. You know, when we first uh, passed Senate Bill 100, first established the program, there was a, still a lot of empty space uh, to be developed. I mean, yes, there were more apartments uh, that were zoned out in the suburbs. You talked about uh, the increasing amount of reuse. But there, 
it, it was a rather loose urban uh, growth boundary at the beginning, and the, so there were several years where that could be filled in. And in fact, in the late 90s, there was a citizen's effort uh, to really try to stop the density, and Metro adopted a defensive measure that basically said, we won't increase density in existing neighborhoods. <laughs> and uh, that was designed to sort of head that uh, measure off at the pass. So this is, this is a very live issue out there. Thank you, Mr. Liberty. You touched on an issue about reusing, repurposing, relating to the parking fights in these urban areas. Can you just talk about that and how you see it evolving? Do we experiment our way through this? Or is there one or two examples that you can show us where things have worked well? Well, <clears throat> parking is one of the main inhibitions to infill and redevelopment. And there, in most parts of the United States, there's a minimum parking required on the property for commercial use and for residential use. Uh, the price of a surface parking space, depending on where you are, is fifteen to thirty thousand dollars. If it's a tuck under, it can be thirty or forty thousand dollars. So, if you require that, what you're saying is it's more important to have a house for the car than a house for the people. So, we've overemphasized parking for cars and not housing for people because there's a direct relationship. In the resident in the commercial street that's four blocks from our house, when the parking requirements were eliminated. You could, the developer could provide parking if she wanted to, but didn't have to. The effect was dramatic. Now, there are places in the United States, cities, that have abolished all parking requirements, all of them, for the whole city. And what you're finding is, uh, and, and actually, when there was a big fight about this about five blocks from our house with a five-story um, apartment building. And it made the city kind of city fathers and mothers hesitate a little bit and backtrack. Well, one of my friends in the neighborhood walked through and counted the number of empty spaces and drive in driveways. And people's garages are full of their ski equipment and old sofas, right? And he said, so we're using public space to provide parking when people already have parking space. So uh, I think when the choice comes down to it, and this is actually reflected in uh, AARP's model ADU ordinance and model middle housing ordinances, Parking is less important than housing for people. And um, one other point I'll make is that <clears throat> when you have a neighborhood that has more things in it that's more accessible, uh, parking becomes less important because you don't have to drive anywhere. Now, if you have a mid-century city, that's a long transition to make. And you mentioned experiment. I like that word. It's, very, it's something elected officials don't like to do. They don't like to call something they're doing an experiment, but I think testing and examining is important. But we need to recognize that having places for people to live and houses for them is more important than places for cars to be parked. And in my, I live in a neighborhood where I didn't own a car for a long time in Portland. I finally got a car. And one of the ironies was, I lived in a fourplex, was, uh, this is a common story, when I got a parking space in front of the fourplex, then I never used my car, because I didn't want to give up my parking space. <laughs> So what was the point of all that, right? And when the weather was bad, I would have to walk as far as two blocks, you know, woe is me. So uh, I think we've, we have a lot of land available in parking spaces that we don't need and that uh, can be put to better use. Bill, haven't seen you in a while. Yes, Robert, we have a, some uh, agreement on a whole bunch of things and a dis disagreement on a couple, but I'd like to get your opinion about what to do about the county problem. Because I live in Jefferson County, I had to fight them tooth and nail, and the problem with the urban planning, with the use of the urban growth boundary and the expanding the 20-year land supply, we've got the county involved in providing urban services albeit low-density urban services, and it's for the executive housing. They live on the peripheral part of this community. They drive through our neighborhood. We can't drive through theirs. 
their kids are bused to school, our kids walk, you're getting the picture. But why are counties allowed to be in the urban service business in Oregon and what can they do about it? We know that Washington County back in the 90s passed a resolution saying they were not going to be in the urban service business. They got thrown out and we saw what happened with that. Anyway, what's your opinion on that? On that? Well, there's a, a bill is expecting a different question. So, <laughs> uh, but as usual, you're interesting and provocative. Um, there was in the beginning of the planning program, there was some people who said, urban planning, urban services, urban development belong to cities and counties shouldn't be in the business. That is not what uh, happened. That was a, a step quite a bit too far. Multnomah County did do what you said, though. They got out, uh, they don't, they provide social services and everything else is um, delegated to uh, partner entities. Uh, I think Western states have this problem where you have municipal development under the control of a county. The other thing about now that I'm no longer elected official and I'm not speaking as a member of the Gorge Commission, one of the other things is a weird dynamic between city and county elections. So people in the city bend vote for Deschutes County Commissioners, but it often looks like the county commissioners are more interested in rural and rural development than they are in uh, conservation and coordination with urban development. So it probably doesn't shock anyone. So I think what you're suggesting would be a better arrangement. And I also think the, the, the degradation of our farm and forest zones into low density sprawl is uh, horrifying. Much better here than other states. Here's a statistic for you. People, they talk about urban sprawl, but when you actually measure something that's urban in terms of population density, I know you're all nerds here, so you're gonna work with me on this. Uh, so a uh, house on one acre or less, when you go to a, a house on five to 40 acres, there's more land in that category in the United States than land in Oregon and California combined. So a big part of the American landscape is now turning into what you're describing. And the consequences for climate change, for food production, for forest production, and for wildlife and resources is spectacular. Bad. Okay, um, this feels like a lot of pressure. <laughs> My name is Jane Doe from the land of Oz. <laughs> Um, so I'm a little bit naive when it comes to land use, but I do have a little bit of an experience here that I had a question about. I served on an advisory board here for the city of Bend, and it was for the use of 500 acres that is earmarked mostly for industrial use and, <clears throat> and mixed use. You all make me nervous. Oh, uh, oh, that's better? I'm sorry. <laughs> you all make me nervous, so I thought I'd hold it farther away. Okay. All right, this is getting easier, thank you. So I served on an advisory board here for the city and it was uh, regarding the development of 500 acres of land here that is available for, that's earmarked for light industrial use and mixed use. And um, one thing that was really clear was that the board, and th the development of this land is based on a master plan that occurred in about 2008 or just prior to the big recession. We all know this year. And so I think the master plan fell through and it was no longer like a reasonable arrangement. Um, one thing that became really clear was that the entire board seemed to have a very clear uh, direction about wanting more affordable housing, um, more affordable development for things like childcare or public services. And it was something that was really difficult to accomplish. So it was, it was our recommendation to expand uses as much as we possibly could, but some of the limitations we faced came directly from CCNRs and design guidelines as well that overpower some of the local land use uh, allowances. <clears throat> so my question <laughs> is uh, how, and kind of, sorry, and just to double back a little bit, was that the, the the problem we were posed with was that the state had mandates on the percentage of the type of development that, it, that like a certain region needed to have, right? So we couldn't completely do away with uh, all of the, 
the light manufacturing development that was that it was earmarked for because there was a, a percentage that was being required of this region before we extend the urban growth boundary. Um, and it's not that I want to extend the urban growth boundary, but how do we change the state mandates or how can we get the state to evolve? Like, can you talk a little bit about that process? And I feel like that was a huge barrier. <laughs> Well, you're actually talking about one of the land use goals, which has to do with preserving enough land for employment. And um, I support this. You have to have land set aside for employment. It comes in different forms. So there's different kinds of industrial land and, of course, commercial land. Now, commercial uses, different kinds of retail uses can be mixed in with residential. And that was a traditional form of, of development. The other thing about industrials, the old, day, old days, it was dangerous often highly toxic and polluting, but a lot, of, a lot of industry now can be next door, in fact, in different cities, is next door to housing, and it's safe. But you still need some land supply. When, so it's pretty hard to answer that without knowing a lot of the details. I wouldn't want to change that requirement. I think we need employment land and industrial land. But uh, one of the things is that employment relationship to acreage has changed dramatically. So you can have a lot of production, and whether it's a lumber mill or a chip plant with very few people. So people tend to think of employment as correlating with acreage. That's not true. Like warehouses, for example, are automated. Very few people, large amount of land, big impact. So going back to the point about quality, which is what kind of employment for whom? And what is the contribution of land supply to it? It's often a modest part. That's not why people, if people located areas because there's abundant land, then North Dakota would be the industrial powerhouse of the United States. It's access to labor, to water, to power, to educated workforce. So uh, all I can say is <clears throat> uh, whether it's employment land or residential land, reduce, reuse, recycle, look at quality, look at outcomes for all people. And not just more is not always better, right? And especially if you supercharge an area with, uh, with more employment, what do you think it does to housing prices? So Oregon's actually had moderate growth rate compared to a lot of places, and I think that's one of the reasons our program's been more effective. We're not overwhelmed by the pace of change. I know you guys have a lot more questions, but... So we're out of time, but I really want to thank these guys, Jeff and Robert, for an awesome presentation and for coming all the way over the pass in what still seems to be winter. Um, I'd like, again, to recognize our title and presenting sponsors for Center State Bank and the City of Bend and all our sponsors that made this free event possible. Um, tonight's lecture has been recorded. Thank you, guys. Um, and will be available on our website soon and be in our library so that um, as you get ready to come to lectures number two and three, you can remind yourself of what you learned in lecture one. Um, I also wanted to let you know that the City Club, our friends at City Club that we've partnered with before, they're fo um, hosting a forum on June 15th, Oregon's Land Use System Trade-Offs and Successes and Continuation of this discussion. Um, if you want more, um, so if you want more on this topic, um, you can register. I think their website is cityclubco.org. You know? no. <laughs> so part two of our lectures will be on May 23rd. It'll be at the Deschutes Brewery Mountain Room um, at, on Simpson Avenue in the upstairs. Um, we'll, there will also be adult beverages there. Um, <laughs> the topic will focus on some newly adopted um, legislation called Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities that really focus on transportation, but also housing um, should be really interesting. It, a lot of it about how we can enact these new roles without sacrificing our quality of life or our livability. And um, we will welcome two speakers. I should have asked for how to say her name. Samia, Samia. thank you. Kini um, from Walker Macy in Portland, as well as Bend native Blaine Merker, who's from Gell. He gave a presentation for Building a Bend a couple of years ago that you might remember. He's a very good speaker. So um, because we have space constraints there, we're asking folks to pre-register for that event, which is not something that we typically do. But again, thank you for coming, and have a great evening.